México Street Photo Fest Síguenos en nuestras redes sociales Hola a todos, bienvenidos a esta transmisión. Buenos días en México y América Latina. Buenas noches, good night to Hamburg, Germany. Hoy recibiremos con gusto a Samuel Lintaro que nos acompaña en esta charla virtual, parte del MX Street Photo Fest. Agradecemos al Centro Queretano de la Imagen y a las Secretarías de Cultura, Educación y Turismo del Poder Ejecutivo del Estado de Querétaro por las facilidades prestadas para la realización de este festival, así como a nuestros patrocinadores Tecnoplanet, Fujifilm México, SGR y Asociados, MediaBoost y MF Fotolab. Hola, Carla. Ok, vamos a conectarnos ahora con nuestro invitado Samuel, Samuel Lintaro. Hola, Samuel. Hey, Hola. how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great. We're very happy to have you today. Uh, we were very anxious waiting for this day. Uh, this is one of the highest points of our festival to be sharing with you. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> You'll do it all right. So what time is it in Hamburg right now? Uh, it's evening, so 6 p.m. right now. 6 p.m., is, okay. Yeah. We were worried we, we were going to make you stay up too late. No, no, this is perfect. I usually have to do streams in the morning, live conferences, because in the US, you know, it's different. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is, this is good. Perfect. Okay, so let me uh, read a, a short profile of you so our audiences can, if, if for any reason they, they don't know who you are, they can get acquainted with you. Samuel Lintaro fotógrafo, videógrafo y embajador de la marca Rico GR desde 2013, nacido en 1988 en Kamakura, Japón, actualmente reside en Hamburgo, Alemania. A los 13 años empezó a experimentar con una cámara de video VHS, estudió la carrera de diseño de la comunicación y desde, desde 2012 se ha dedicado al fotoperiodismo y videografía desde entonces ha fundado su propia empresa de videoproducción en 2017, año en el que también inició su popular canal de YouTube, Samuel Street Life. Samuel Intaro, thank you for being with us. I don't want to uh, spend our time uh, talking, so please, I'm having. Don't leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you so much for having me. This is um, a great honor for me. It's the first time that someone invited me to a festival. So thank you for doing that. Um, really appreciate it. And thanks to uh, Louis as well, who contacted me. And uh, I've watched um, the other presentations and the opening and it seemed like a very fun festival. I'm sad that I missed it. And uh, I wish I could be there uh, in, in physical form. Um, you know, uh, Shokubin is, is right here with us. Ah, okay. Oh, I just wanted to say hi, hi to them. But uh, yeah, greetings to uh, Grecia and uh, David from, from Germany, my friends that came all the way from Germany just to see me. No, they are just on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can see the audience, right? You don't have a camera for uh, me to uh, see. I can, I can turn this around. Uh, okay, uh, Carolina is going to, to show you the audience. Cool. <laughs> ah, no, okay. Nice. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, hope... <laughs> yeah, I hope uh, English is fine for all of you. I can speak Spanish, unfortunately. I have two brothers and they can both speak Spanish fluently. I'm very jealous of that. But they spent some time in, you know, in Spain and in Colombia. So I have to do it in English. All right. Um, yeah, I have a presentation prepared. Um, are you guys going to um, pop it up on the screen or should yes. I? Yes. Yes. Uh, la, la presentación aquí. 
Yes, we're, we're going to put the presentation on screen. Uh, Caroline is telling me you have to put it on the screen. So, oh, I, I present my presentation here? Yes. Um, okay, it's fine. I can do that. Um, okay. So, can I have to do a little bit of setting up? So, oops. Sorry, I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> okay, don't worry. It should, should be fast. Um, okay, choosing my second screen here. Uh, let me know if you can see my okay. screen. Probably mm, not. We're not able to see you, your presentation yet. Maybe this one. Oh, I have to give my browser permission. It's my fault. It's my fault. Sorry. Um, I have a new computer and I have to give some new permissions here. Okay, yes, that happens. Uh, so the um, <laughs> the problem is I have to restart uh, my browser. Is, is that okay? Okay, let me see <laughs> if I if, if we can put the presentation from this side. Yeah. So in the meantime, you know, I, I was preparing ah, some... I'm sorry, Hector, I can, I can show... Oh, no, I thought I can, sorry. Okay, so in the meantime, you know, we were preparing some questions to the end of the chat, but maybe we can go ahead and, and just ask you one to fill in time, or you or maybe you need to be focused on your machine. Um, uh, I think at the end would be better because yes. I might talk about things in the presentation um, yes, of course. that you have questions for. Um, yeah, sorry, I thought that you will share the presentation on your side, but um, if it's okay, then I can come back, give me 10 seconds and I'm back. Yes, and of course. Should, should be okay, you have to put me back into this, but uh, let me do that, okay? Yes, of course. Right. Bueno, le pedimos a la audiencia que nos tenga un poco de paciencia. Samuel está estrenando computadora y tuvo que reiniciar su navegador para darle los permisos apropiados al navegador para transmitir su presentación. Les recuerdo que esta es una charla en vivo del MX Street Photo Fest con Samuel Intado desde Hamburgo, Alemania. Lo conocerán por su canal de YouTube Samuel Street Live. Eh, supongo que si están aquí en esta charla es porque ya han visto alguno de sus videos. Eh, lo recordamos por ser embajador de la marca Rico GR, por la serie de, de videos con embajadores y fotógrafos de la cámara Rico alrededor del mundo, por sus videos de consejos sobre fotografía callejera, reflexiones, entrevistas, etc. Sin duda podemos decir que todos hemos aprendido de él. Y me indica Carolina que estamos de vuelta con Samuel. Samuel, welcome back. Yeah, thanks for, for waiting. Um, should work now. Yeah, I see it on your perfect. screen as well. We can see okay, it. Okay, perfect. So thanks guys for, for waiting. Um, let's start. Um, so my my presentation is going to be um, about a little bit about myself, uh, what I'm doing, what I've done so far, what I'm going to do, maybe my street photography work, of course, I will share a little bit of my philosophy. And um, that's something that uh, Louis, uh, Louis, right, uh, specifically uh, asked me to do, share a little bit about myself. Um, because I heard that uh, a lot of uh, you guys in Mexico, and I know this from my, from my YouTube channel, my community, I get lots of messages from, from, from Mexico. And um, it's really nice uh, hearing from the other side of the world. So, um, but I have some information also to share that maybe people who don't know me uh, might also appreciate. Okay, so, uh, all right, how do I move on? So, 
All right, so to, I will start with an introduction, a little bit about how I started. Um, then I will talk about my uh, artistic uh, influences and how I discovered street photography. And then uh, at the end, I'm going to share some of my work and projects, um, which is also going to be, of course, stuff that I do on social media. But I will be focusing more, mostly on, on the work, not so much on the content, um, but we can talk about it later as well. And then at the end, um, we can do a Q&A if you have questions, then uh, we can do that. So um, I think I have not more than an hour, right? I'm, I'm, I'm tr I will try to finish in like 45 minutes, maybe. Um, let me set up a timer real quick or stopwatch. So, okay, let's go. So, yeah, uh, Hector gave uh, a great introduction. Um, I think it sounded very good. Um, so this is where I was born. Uh, I was born in, in Japan in uh, a little town called Kamakura, which is not far from Tokyo. And um, that is uh, 1988. That's when I was born. This is me on the right. And on the left, you see um, the famous uh, Daibutsu Buddha statue. It's a famous um, landmark or tourist uh, place to visit in, Kam in Kamakura. So I was born in Japan, but my parents moved to Germany um, after I um, became one years old. So I basically grew up in Germany, in, in Hamburg, which is a city in North Germany. In my opinion, the most beautiful city in Germany. And uh, very beautiful, very green, lots of water. And um, so this is my background, where I come from. And technically, I don't live there anymore. I live a little bit outside of the city. I moved to the countryside. But I still consider Hamburg my my city, and uh, I'm always taking photos in in Hamburg. And I have two brothers, as I already mentioned. Um, this is not this is a, for me. It's an important uh, detail because my brothers and I we always do everything together. Um, we, um, for example, uh, did a lot of uh, skateboarding in the past, and my brothers would always follow what I do. Um, and uh, one of my brothers is still skating um, and uh, my little brother is uh, now a, a painter and uh, we always do stuff together and um, yeah. So this is basically what my, uh, how my childhood look, looked like. Um, I was really into skateboarding and uh, drawing little mangas or cartoons, anime and stuff like that, uh, huge influence. That was um, where all my focus was in my childhood. Uh, then um, I studied uh, communication design. So basically it's graphic design, but it also has um, some uh, filmmaking uh, included. And um, it's uh, there's also some communication science in, involved. And this is something that uh, I didn't really know what to do with my life. Um, I always know, knew that I wanted to do something creative. And I think, yeah, I did an internship um, with a graphic designer during um, elementary school days. And then he suggested to me that I should um, study something in this field because he saw that I have an eye for composition or layout. Um, this is a moment here uh, in, in, this, in the school uh, where we played a little bit in a, in a photo studio. And this gave me a lot of, um, lots of access to things that I have never tried before, like, yeah, like graphic design, for example, uh, 3D animation um, and uh, layouting, magazine, editorial uh, work. Um, so it was a very fruitful uh, years. And um, I was al already doing photography before this. And I actually applied with photography work. And I thought that I would become a designer who does photography as a hobby um, but then uh, during my studies I met uh, a photography teacher who is, who is still also is uh, a working photographer photojournalist and he really um, encouraged me to become freelance so and I graduated 2012 um, yeah uh, this is uh, we're doing some printing here learning about how to to print from digital to uh, to the print um, where there were some filmmaking lessons. So, and then uh, a very important um, 
moment uh, in my career. So I just finished um, my studies and uh, I got an offer from a, a well-known uh, German advertising agency um, to become an intern for their company. And my mother and my parents, of course, they said, of course, you have to take it. This is a great opportunity. But I was already, I already decided that I don't want to, I don't want to be in the advertising world anymore. This, uh, these three years of studying um, advertisements, uh, advertising and communication design were enough to, to show me that I'm, I'm not someone who wants to create a campaign for someone else in a, in a style that someone else wants me to do, if you know what I mean. So um, I don't think I can, I work well in, in bigger groups. Um, I like to have control. And I really wanted to become a photographer. And I will talk about this specific uh, decision later on in my um, section about my influences. So I had two decisions, um, become an intern and maybe get a full-time position or um, work for myself, so freelance. And then de decided, uh, let's give it a shot. And if I fail, then I can always maybe come back to my original profession. And then uh, I really wanted to become a, a photojournalist. That was one of my uh, big dreams. And through a photographer who was my teacher also, um, who was a photojournalist, um, I was able to um, also uh, become a member of this agency called Visum Images, which is a photojournalism agency uh, founded in uh, in Germany. And uh, it was it used to be a very prestigious uh, agency and. People often referred to it as the German uh, Magnum, but the reality is when I joined them, uh, I heard all these things and I was excited. But uh, when I came to present myself and my work, it was only one small office and uh, three, uh, three people working in that office. And uh, now the agency is bigger again, but um, yeah, they were very happy to have someone new, someone young and they signed me up, and um, so the the thing is, when when you when you sign up at the photojournalism agency, they they just wait for your images for your projects to come into the system, and then they will um, distribute your work to magazines, and hopefully sell some of your work, and then you get a little commission or they get a commission from your work. But the rea reality is, uh, I never sold a single image because. Um, First of all, you have to always be the first when it comes to, uh, let's say, uh, news and event and current events. You always have to be very fast. I had no driver's license, no car. Um, I had my small little Pentax camera with manual lenses because I c couldn't afford all the professional equipment. And I was just always the last who uploaded um, images. So I spent most of my time just concentrating on building my portfolio and working on uh, personal projects and this is um, my first um, my first real photography project that um, I did for my um, this is my graduation um, project um, I graduated uh, with this project and it is a photo uh, documentary um, reportage about uh, music students uh, foreign music students that uh, come to Germany to study classical music and I had a lot of classical uh, musician uh, friends in my uh, environment. I was also living with a classical uh, stu music uh, musician in, uh, in a shared apartment and it was a topic that interests me because in Germany if you look at the um, music schools there are a lot of Eastern Europe European people and uh, Asian people uh, students, but not so many German students, which I found strange. So I wanted to explore this topic. And uh, I picked out uh, four different uh, students from different schools and followed them, uh, captured their daily life, um, went to concerts and uh, took portraits of them. And the idea here was that I take a formal portrait, something that they would show um, when they present uh, on, on uh, a concert uh, invitation card or something like that or to um, 
to apply for for an orchestra and then uh, put next to it a photo a more casual um, photograph of them in their private life yeah and this is uh, Jorge uh, a singer um, who I also followed just going to move quickly through them this is uh, an Ukrainian uh, violinist uh, it was very difficult to take photos of her because she often would not show up to our meetings uh, which made it difficult to finish this project but uh, I got enough for my uh, project and this is uh, actually my roommate uh, Hosaka uh, Masanori um, through him I learned a lot uh, I learned a, a lot of um, the industry and uh, got into contact with a lot of um, a lot of people who gave me access to also um, document some other things all right and uh, I made a photo book out of it here are some impressions of the book and uh, here are some screenshots from um, a film that I did it's a 45 minute ish long film which you can't watch anywhere online because I don't have the, the rights to most of these clips which is unfortunate but um, yeah it was an exercise and I used this to apply um, to the photojournalism agency and for them it was enough they saw this and they said okay it looks like you can you can deliver us uh, some images some behind the scenes here so and then um, of course at that time this was my first big project and I was still in the middle of building my portfolio and when I uh, went to this book binder to make um, the book uh, I couldn't resist also um, doing a little project about this book binder because we we talked a lot we met a lot and he was a very um, interesting character there are also not many book uh, binding um, craftsmen uh, in Germany anymore everything is moving to digital and big factories so that was also uh, something that I noticed and um, really enjoyed also taking photos of him and there's a little um, cross-media project of this um, series you can watch on my website which includes also um, an audio interview on top of these images it's in German though but so but this is what you got to do to build your portfolio you take what you can every opportunity um, you should uh, grab then I was also doing some uh, theater photography um, you can sign up to um, uh, newsletters for different uh, theaters and then they send you um, uh, informations of um, like preview um, preview uh, shows that you can uh, photograph and then you can send it to your agency or some other place before um, the show premieres officially and that is uh, something I did but as I said uh, no image ever got published because I was always too late okay another uh, milestone is probably um, my relationship with uh, Rico goes all the way back to 2012 actually so when I uh, my graduation project so the one I showed you here with the musicians that was all shot with uh, Pentax cameras uh, my first uh, real camera was a Pentax DSLR and one of my professors or teachers at university um, was also working for Pentax and Rico imaging and he saw the, the project and um, uh, noticed that I was using Rico Pentax cameras and then uh, he asked if he can uh, use that project to show at uh, Photokina which was a big uh, photo convention that's how our, my relationship with Rico started and then in 2013 out of nowhere I actually really didn't know that this is coming they just sent me a box uh, I remember it uh, like it is today because I actually took a photo here of of how I how, how it looked like when I opened the box and it was a written letter addressed to me and uh, you know that was like so strange because I to be honest I had no idea this camera exists before <laughs> until this point um, but I, I was doing a lot of work for them you know there was a GXR also before that which they uh, borrowed uh, or gave me to, to take some photos for it um, so yeah I became a G ambassador suddenly 
And then I started, you know, researching, okay, what is this camera known for? Of course, I got a little briefing from them, but um, that's also when I um, discovered Daido Moriyama. Shame on me that I didn't discover him earlier. But that gave me an idea what this camera stands for. And then I started to um, use it uh, for snapshot photography, which up until this point, I didn't even know this. Uh, there's a whole um, concept or community behind it, taking photos candidly. So I also attribute um, the, the Rico and the GR for um, getting me into street photography. So, but I will talk about it more later. Um, so continuing with my uh, photojournalism endeavors. So now I was using the GR also for capturing photos like this, documenting protests. And this was a little um, protest in Berlin. Uh, what was it about? It was about um, raising awareness uh, about the refugee crisis in Greek at the shore. The refugees would drown and uh, no, nobody would do anything about it. So they did a, a symbolic funeral. So they brought all these um, tombs or made all these crosses and created a little funeral um, uh, graveyard situation in front of the parliament in Berlin, um, which is something that's that you're not allowed to do. And that was uh, something very interesting to document. Um, the photo on the top left corner is, was shot on a 5D. Um, that was a camera that I was using because I knew that all the photojournalists used a 5D. But I was also using my GR and um, this was my little James Nachtway face. But more on that later. Okay, another um, project I'm very proud of and um, something that's uh, very close to me to me and my to my heart is uh, this project here. Um, I, I'm also practicing Taekwondo um, more than 50 years by now and I got this opportunity to um, document uh, a little historic event. So this year is, um, his name is Master Kwon, Kwon Jae Ha, who is uh, a Korean grandmaster who was uh, one of uh, six or seven, quite don't know anymore, but um, one of you uh, Taekwondo masters who were sent from the government from Korea to go to the Western countries to teach Taekwondo to the Western world. And my master Kwon here was assigned to go to Germany. And uh, 50 years later, um, he did a big re reunion fest um, meetup um, where all his uh, students and all the schools that were founded after him or because of him met at this location. And one of the uh, owners of a school in, in Hamburg um, wanted me to document it and he's also one of his personal um, students or one of Master Kwon's students. So every, each uh, person here on this frame owns a school somewhere in Germany and uh, that was a, for me a very interesting event to document because uh, it's a topic that um, I'm interested in and uh, it gave me also opportunity to add something to my portfolio. Yeah, and these images are now very super valuable for, for the community of, of Master Kwon, or I hope it is, <laughs> because uh, next the next year, the following year, he retired. Um, so he's not practicing anymore, he's not teaching anymore. So this was, uh, these are basically his last moments. And um, so I'm showing you this because uh, it will all make sense at the end because um, this is important to see if you want to understand how I got into street photography and how I look at street photography as well. Uh, whenever I do these documentary projects, there are always elements that um, you also see on the street. Um, I like to see and look at um, things that are not uh, obvious or little stories that are happening around the main event. For example, these um, Taekwondo students here, they had to prepare to um, give a demonstration or a little show for Master Kwon. So they would wait until it's their turn um, and uh, you would see these little moments of them either relaxing or being very nervous and preparing mentally also, um, which I like to also document. 
So, and then to show you that uh, I still had to take, uh, um, uh, I had to have um, side jobs, uh, part-time jobs as well. I was working at a coffee shop also. Uh, I was working at a bakery here, as you can see on the right. Um, I would also freelance uh, for uh, publishing houses. I was uh, once working like almost two months at a, a manga uh, publishing house and doing little retouches on the on the on the books uh, and doing some catering work as well because uh, obviously my photojournalism work didn't pay the bills all right and uh, i would also do some photo uh, work that i'm not necessarily including in my portfolio but um, it does also uh, pay a little bit uh, for example i once had to take um, a full day of uh, uh, photos for for um, how do you say for, for it was a convention for um, for universities and I was hired by the convention uh, to be there and uh, give everyone a free um, portrait so that they can use uh, to apply for university. I would also shoot weddings a lot. Um, I also sometimes still. To, uh, take uh, weddings in summer I'm not I don't need to do it I do it if the conditions are good and I have I want to do it um, but uh, weddings are also a good training and um, weddings pay better than documentary work and uh, I would also do some editorial work sometimes, um, taking photos for um, articles or um, being hired to take uh, stills during video productions. In this case, this was uh, for a campaign for Samsung, uh, for a wash machine, and uh, <laughs> they uh, documented two uh, influencers that I never heard of, but uh, they're quite big somehow. Um, yeah, and I took photos of them so that they can use it for social media. So, and then I uh, realized that um, if I want to make money uh, as a freelancer, as a photographer, I definitely have to add video to my uh, skill list. And I would always um, shoot video for myself as well. And uh, during my skateboarding years, um, I would make lots of uh, skate films, skate videos, for my friends, um, for a local skate shop as well. So I was, I'm quite familiar when it comes to making videos, um, but uh, I shifted more and more to towards offering more video productions as, um, yeah, some some as part of my portfolio. And then I would do stuff like uh, this, like cooking shows. Uh, this. I was, this is not my production, but I was hired as a second uh, camera operator. And um, I would also be hired by advertising agency to help with their productions. And um, and that's totally okay. I enjoy doing that as long as it is, it is not my campaign and I'm just there to be their DOP and, you know, take care of the lights and te take uh, the gear. Then um, that's something that I enjoy doing um yeah so and then uh we arrive at 2017 uh i i actually had um i i founded my own uh, video production company uh, a little bit before i started my youtube channel um and then this company didn't do very well i had very i had a lot of trouble uh, acquiring new clients that's not not something i'm good at i don't like to knock on doors and present myself and sell myself that's not something that i enjoy doing so in order to escape that uh, important task something that you definitely have to do as a freelancer um, i started a youtube channel because i wanted to work on something that i want that i enjoy um, a little back story here um, for some of you who maybe know my channel uh, originally i started my youtube channel just to prove a point to a friend because a friend of mine uh, wanted uh, to start a YouTube channel with them together and make little like fun comedy sketches but I told them ah it's not really me uh, if I wanted if I make a YouTube channel I want to uh, it about photography 
And uh, he said, yeah, but definitely do it uh, in German, uh, not in English. Uh, you can't do it in English. You're not English native speaker. Uh, it's too embarrassing. Stick to German. And I thought, no, I'm going to prove him wrong and just do it in English anyways. And I just did it. Um, and also didn't tell my, my friends, and my family uh, until half a year into it. Um, because this is really something I did to prove to myself that I can do it. You know, I can be in front of the camera, which was very uncomfortable for me before I started my YouTube channel. I really didn't like it. I had to be in front of the camera for Rico sometimes where other people would film me and it's, it was really awkward and I hate these videos. You can still find them on YouTube if you look hard enough. So, um, and um, also a little fun fact here is um, my name is uh, Samuel. That's really my name. But people don't know, didn't know me as Samuel before my channel because I would always use my Japanese name, so Lintaro, Lintaro, um, which uh, my family uh, uses. But in my passport, it says Samuel Lintaro. So I used my German name because I didn't want people to find out that I have a YouTube channel. And then I decided, okay, let's continue with this name. And now I got used to it. And um, it doesn't matter what how people call me, if they call me Samuel or Lintaro, either way is fine. So uh, I will go a little bit more into what I'm doing on YouTube. Um, but um, the goal was to share my passion for photography and I was also taking street photography more serious during this time. So I started with um, sharing um, like little POV videos of me experimenting with street photography. Eventually I would um, start interviewing people that I find interesting. And I always say that I started street, photo street photography in 2013, which I did, but really consciously doing street photography, knowing that there is a genre called street photography. I did around 2015 to 17, maybe. And when I started my YouTube channel, I um, I really wanted to dive deep into it. And I forgot to include this here in my uh, in my presentation, but I also have to give a lot of um, credit to Eric Kim. I don't know if you guys uh, remember Eric Kim, Eric Kim Street Photography Blog. Uh, he was someone who was very active on social media and probably the only person who was also very active on YouTube, um, sharing street photography content. And his personality, you know, his character, you can like him or hate him. I had no particular feeling about him as a person, but I really um, appreciated what he did. And I watched all of his um, YouTube videos, even though they were produced very poorly. Um, but that was uh, kind of the charm. And he was um, introducing the world um, no he was introducing a new street photographers to the world and I wanted to do the same and uh, I wanted to learn from other photographers that's why I started this series that I call on the street with uh, you might have seen a few episodes um, uh, Gustavo Minas here on the top left he's also uh, part of this festival right and uh, never met him before he came to Hamburg for his book launch I just uh, wrote him a message and said, you know, let me show you around. And then we did this video. Um, other uh, characters um, we will also see later. Yes. And I also do a lot of uh, video work for, for Rico, for, for their YouTube channel. As an ambassador, I uh, do lots of ambassador work. I don't know. Uh, we could talk about it later, maybe if you have questions. Uh, what it means to be an ambassador, we can go into it, but um, more than just showing that I use their cameras, I'm also involved in um, connecting to the community via via these uh, online videos. And we do these uh, meetups in Europe as well. We call them GR Cities. And look, you see David here in the right corner. Uh, I also did a video with uh, David here as well. Okay, and then uh, 2021, I moved out of the city into the countryside. I uh, still live here outside of Hamburg. And um, this is something that is now, um, uh, how do you say, I deal with, with this situation right now. 
I'm a street photographer who doesn't live in the city anymore. So that's a huge change. Okay, so I hope this wasn't too boring. Uh, let's go into uh, some of my uh, artistic influences and um, how I actually ended up discovering street photography and who influenced me in the street photography world and um, my philosophy. Let's go. So very early influences uh, from my family. Um, my mother studied uh, glass painting. That's the reason why she came to Germany. Um, so she was always um, artistic. Um, also, she plays music, uh, piano. Uh, my grandfather, my Japanese grandfather, uh, was a, a painter, an artist in Japan. A uh, huge inspiration, learned a lot from him. And every time we would visit him, he would ask me, you know, what are you doing now? Show me your drawings, show me your photos. And uh, definitely a big mentor of mine. And then my German uh, grandfather, who also um, passed away um, uh, long uh, 2020 or 21, um, he uh, was an organ builder, so a craftsman. Uh, also very respected uh, profession. I really admired uh, what he was able to do with his fingers. And um, this is an organ he built and uh, also a huge inspiration. So I had all these... Uh, influences already in my childhood and I'm um, very grateful for them um, yeah a little bit more of my grandfather these are photos I took uh, of the, of him because of course I was into photography and he's a painter and of course I take photos of him he would also um, often ask me to take photos of his paintings um, which I uh, of course also did and uh, yeah, uh, not going to do, go too deep into what his work is, but um, he's focusing on, on um, this basically is, uh, his art is a way of dealing with his trauma because in, in his childhood he uh, witnessed, witnessed um, uh, the U US bombing uh, Tokyo and uh, this what you see here is um, a scene of that. Um, and he's dealing with that trauma uh, through his, his work, which looks very happy and pop art-like, uh, but it has um, always a, a war as a theme. And then I found this uh, photo in one of his uh, books. Um, so he apparently also used a film camera. It's not a Leica, but uh, he took a mirror selfie. So, yeah, I thought it was cool. Um that's some old work of his. Um, yeah, but definitely huge inspiration. Okay, uh, some you probably also have some similar influences here. Um, this is another childhood influence, uh, of course, anime, manga, Dragon Ball, uh, huge inspiration. I actually wanted to become a manga artist. Um, I really got into it when I was like around 13, 14 years old. Uh, Astro Boy, Akira huge influ influence and I learned so much about how to compose you know how to tell a story through these uh, mangas and uh, films and uh, another huge influence is uh, skateboarding um, a lot of uh, well-known photographers uh, or filmmakers also uh, come from a skateboarding background um, skateboarding is very creative uh, you express yourself by movement and the skateboarding community um, was uh, definitely shaped how my, how do you say, my, my teenage years. Um, yeah, what can I say? It's a huge influence. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the influences within the skateboarding community was also, was, uh, also other um, skateboarding photographers. This is uh, Fred uh, Montagne, a uh, French photographer. And his work stood out to me because it was very uh, artistic, stylish, minimal. I, I haven't seen this kind of uh, skateboarding photography before. So that definitely um, influenced me as well, um, looking at um, skateboarding in, in a more, more like an art form. This is, for example, a photo that I took. Um, I was taking also photographs of, of other skateboarders. Um, never really got into it as something I wanted to pursue. But I have some friends who are now 
photographing for magazines and um, it's a fun thing to do and street skating uh, has lots of similarities um, with street photography that's something i uh i also would like to talk about in more details uh, detail um, but not in this presentation but it's very interesting and street street photography actually gave me something that i got from skateboarding from st street skating because um I uh, injured my foot and I'm not I was not able to skate anymore and street skate, street street photography is uh, for me the closest thing to that feeling of being a street skater. Uh, some skateboarding work I did for for Rico or Pentax this was uh, with with the Pentax 645Z um, medium format camera. Um, typography was also an influence uh, when I was studying communication design. We would have these exercises to do. Uh, very good to explore typography and graphic design if you want to shape your eye and get a sense for composition. Uh, I look in, I'm looking at the clock here right now and we'll move on and be a little faster. So uh, big mentor here. Uh, this is uh, my photography teacher, uh, Ralf Niemzig, um, who's still a photographer and he opened my eyes to um, the possibility even to pursue a freelance career. Uh, he really encouraged me to, to try it out. He said, if you, if you have an interest in become a becoming a photographer or freelance, you should really do it. He said, he said that he, does, he doesn't regret it. And he said, you know, if you need help, I will help you. And so he was really encouraging and I owe a lot to him because you know, when you're in your, uh, in your 20s, I don't think you have figured out what to do, right? Or most people don't know what to do. And he said, you know, if you have that feeling that you want to do it, just do it. And that helped me just go with my gut feeling. Uh, this is some of his work. Um, he also showed me that, uh, that you can use a wide angle lens and... Uh, I was using uh, mostly tele lenses or long lenses, like a 50 millimeter was, or 50 or 75, something like that. Even a 135 millimeter was one of my lenses. So seeing this was very exciting, interesting, new, fresh. Um, so I also started to to adapt and uh, use wider lenses. And uh, for example, this is a photograph of mine, and you can clearly see the influence, right? Putting a subject in the corner of the frame distorting them but being very close uh, that's something that i learned from him he also introduced me to this uh, movie war photographer uh, with james nachtway huge uh, inspiration uh, after i saw this movie i decided to become a photojournalist or i decided to do something where i tell stories through photography this really uh, ignited a passion or a fire within me so huge influence uh, if you haven't seen this uh, movie yet then you sh definitely should um yeah crazy stuff and you probably heard of him uh, amazing photographer sebastiao salgado another huge inspiration um not so much his uh, journalism work but his um also his nature work, Genesis, is one of the books I also own. Um, yeah, a true master and learned a lot uh, of him as well. And um, I also don't always just look at the photography uh, when I look at other photographers. I also like to know what these photographers are uh, thinking, what, uh, what their philosophy is. And, uh, you know, Salgado is a huge environmentalist as well. And uh, his project Genesis... Um, uh, was also you could you can consider it as a uh, as his it's a form of activism showing um, parts of the world uh, that is uh, untouched uh, from humanity and uh, yeah definitely inspiring uh, Daido Moriyama of course um, I'm not a to be honest I I'm not really a huge fan of his work I can appreciate it but um, he didn't influence me in a way that I wanted to become Dolido Moriyama, like a lot of people who discover the Rico GR and his work, um, they really become huge fan of his. 
and uh, his work is uh, revolutionary because um, it is so different to the work I showed you with the other photographers and um, it's so freeing and it's 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 uh, you know snapshot photography that's that's how I discovered snapshot photography and he inspired me to use my GR like freely don't care about the image being not straight and having motion blur whatever um, and seeing also what else photography can be because up until this point I would always think too much maybe about my work I would I would have these images in mind you know I would see I would have these James Nachtway images these Salgado images and then I would apply them to my work and then he showed me that you know I should also break the rules sometimes um, yeah so okay so I was already doing snapshot photography or street photography travel photography but I didn't know there's a genre that uh, is called street photography and then I discovered and somehow I found this online article that showed photos of uh, from Matt Stewart and also from Siegfried Hansen a uh, German street photographer um, and the article was titled something like um, the the theater of life or humor on the street or something like that I don't remember and I saw these images and I, I couldn't believe that these are unstaged and these are real uh, I, I, def I really couldn't believe it and I was really impressed by it um, and uh, very fascinated by it and I thought this is this is called uh, I thought this this must be a, a, another genre of photography and I thought maybe it's called humor photography so I, I met Stuart and Siegfried Hansen I saved in my in my mind in my head I saved it as humor photography until uh, in 2015 uh, I saw this book Street Photography Now um, this is obviously uh, Matt Stewart's work here on the cover and then I saw this work again and now I figured out ah this is called street photography ah I see so this is um, my street photography bible or how I uh, learned what street photography is and what other street photographers are out there uh, during my uh, university years, I would um, already see work of, uh, you know, Henri Cartier-Bresson and I was also studying Gordon Parks and all these um, old American uh, photographers. But I never saw, thought of their work as street photography. So, and then uh, in 2018, um, I met uh, Tatsuo Rizuki, Um Maybe you saw him on my YouTube channel before um, because there aren't many videos of him online. Um, so I, um, how do you say? So to be honest, I never heard about him until I found out that he was invited for an exhibition in my city. That was around 2017. I saw this post on Facebook. Um, someone posted about this exhibition. And I thought, oh, this looks cool. What is the, who's this photographer? Ah, oh, Void Tokyo Collective from Tokyo. Sounds interesting. So that's how I discovered him. And then I knew that he would come to my city the next year. And I really wanted to meet him and uh, do something for my YouTube channel. So um, because I can't really write uh, in Japanese, uh, I asked my wife to send him an email or translate an email for me. And uh, I basically asked him, uh, told him that uh, if he needs any guidance or assistance here in, in Hamburg, um, you know, I can speak Japanese so uh, he wouldn't have to worry about that. And I just offered him my help. I didn't mention anything about a video at all. I just wanted to meet him and offer him my help. Then um, no reply. Uh, there was no reply. And my uh, wife also didn't send the email until one day before his flight to Germany so that also has something to do with it and then I already saw on Instagram that he was already landed in Hamburg and I, I thought oh it's over I missed my chance but um, I didn't give up and uh, I found out who who was the organizer of this exhibition and I reached out to him and said you know I reached out to Tatsu and wanted to 
uh, meet him and help him. And uh, if you need any help with the exhibition, uh, I could also make a video about this event. And then he was very happy about it and said, sure, you know, you can come help us uh, setting it up. We can meet here at the venue and then talk about everything. Um, later, he and I, we, be we became good friends um, as well. So, uh, so I went to this uh, exhibition place and uh, I wasn't hoping to get much out of this because, you know, he just landed in, in Germany and I didn't want to say like, hi, uh, let's make a YouTube video together. Um, so I met Damon, this is the organizer, Damon Ja, shout out. Um, and uh, he said, yeah, Tatsu is here in this other room, you can say hi to him. And I walked into this room and he looked very tired, probably jet lagged. And he looked at me like, like, who are you, <laughs> right? Because he, did, he doesn't know. And I uh, talked to him in Japanese and said, I wrote you an email. Um, maybe you didn't see it. I uh, just wanted to offer you help if you need any help here. And he's like, oh, cool. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, yeah, nice to meet you, blah, blah. Uh, that's it. And I didn't, I didn't have the courage to ask him to you know, work together. And then uh, I was chatting to the organizer again and um, saw that Tatsu was smoking outside. And I just sat down next to him and asked him, you know, have you seen the city yet? And he said, no, I haven't seen anything. I just came here. I said, oh, you should really check out uh, Hamburg and do some photography here. I think you will like it. He said, yeah, I really would like to, but I don't know if I should just, if, if I should ask, um, because he feels bad asking um, the people who invited him if he is, if he can go to the city, because everyone is doing all this work for him. That's typical Japanese um how do you say modesty um, he didn't want to uh, yeah he didn't want to ask he was uh, too embarrassed to ask so i said don't worry you know germans they like to be direct and uh, they they totally will understand so and then i walked to to damon and said you know tatsu really wants to go to the city and damon said oh yeah of course of course and then could you maybe um, take care of him and show him the city i said oh yeah of course and then i asked tatsu if he's okay with that, if I show him the city and he said, yeah, that would be great. And then uh, I, quick, I quickly mentioned, you know, I might bring a video camera. He said, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. So, and then we met the next day and then we filmed that video you can see on my channel. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely a big also influence uh, for me because I never, I've never seen someone take photos so openly and bold uh, it was inspiring and frightening at the same time because you know I had to take care of him so I was just responsible for him and there were like German people shouting you know come back here and you know get away with your fucking camera and sorry for swearing but um, it was very challenging and um, yeah exciting uh, le definitely left an impression and then um Later on, uh, he um, introduced me to his collective in Tokyo as well. So uh, it kind of built a little relationship and he was very happy with the video and I was very happy to be able to give him uh, a platform where he can present himself because there were no videos on him online and I really wanted to see him work. Okay. This is one uh, moment uh, in, in Hamburg. Um, he just went up to this couple that was like kissing and he was like, uh, let me take a photo. And they were like, oh, sure, why not? And then he took like very close photos of them kissing. Uh, yeah, it was fun. There's a little screenshot of this video. Uh, okay, to end this uh, section here. Um, of course, photography is, a, other photographers are a huge influence, but um, I also get a lot of inspiration from other arts musicians, composers, filmmakers. Um, uh, I, I study more than just photography. And I think it's very important to have other interests. If you only look at other photographers, then you will end up mimicking what other photographers do. And there's so many interesting personalities um, in other fields that are equally uh, um, important or interest, interesting to study. So just to show that I have other interests as well, and they all play a huge influence. 
so um 50 minutes uh we will we will make it don't worry so um okay some of my street photography work and projects um i put street here in um i don't know what's called in english you know in klammern in germany and german uh because yeah it's street photography but also it also mixes in with some some personal work and some more documentary style photography okay i have this um in categories so and each category category has a different philosophy because over the years i changed my approach a little bit so from 2016 to uh, 13 to 16 my philosophy was to just shoot 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 and don't think about the images just learn experiment try dory uh, moriyama style try i don't know alex webb style whatever just shoot 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 and uh with the gr um, the concept of having a small camera with you that can take photos that you can print big and this high quality that was um, something new at that time i mean the gr exists since uh 1996 yeah um, but an aps-c gr that has this image quality that was new and uh, when i was um, traveling for work and this is uh, the airport in barcelona i would have my gr with me to take photos while i'm on the move while i'm going somewhere and just to be able to do that was uh, very yeah exciting to me so so these are mostly like snapshots i do in, in in cities when i'm on the move here you can see a little bit of dido coming in maybe um not really focusing on people too much but trying to make something interesting out of daily life of ordinary things um experimenting a little bit with uh, slow shutter speeds then came a phase where i really wanted to go close and take candid photos of people and the first thing you do is when you uh, try try that um, is to shoot from the hip right or don't look at your camera and uh, try to be more sneaky so i would have my gr and always shoot it uh, from the hip without looking at a screen that's why the angle is a little uh, tilted and um, i thought i had to do this to get more comfortable but you can tell that these photos were taken from the hip and um, i liked them because i got close but as an image they were not that interesting to me but it was a practice then i started a little uh, series that i called um, drive by uh, basically every time i'm on my bike in the car in the bus in the train i would take photos out of outside of the window just another excuse to take photos of people um, without them seeing me um, this is like nothing groundbreaking but um, it allowed me to get some moments and some situations that i would maybe not get otherwise and i like the concept of capturing what is passing by a driving car so 2017 to 19 um, is definitely uh, how do you say the high phase or honeymoon phase of my street photography uh, career um, a phase where i um, felt more and more comfortable and my philosophy at that time was um, yeah documenting the human experience in urban environments 100 percent candid nothing else is allowed it has to be candid and composition and layers are important um, these were my values in street photography i wanted to document what it's like to be in a city it had to be candid and it had to be well composed so um here are some images i don't know if i should talk about each and every uh, single individual image maybe not but um this is uh, obviously a photo that um, that gains from this uh, juxtaposition moment uh, an influence here was for example the photographer jonathan hickby who um, did this um, book um, oh i forgot the title coincidence something with coincidence um, but he was uh, a master when it comes to juxtapositions nowadays we see this type of imagery a lot in, in the street photography genre um, i like when it's done cleverly and i like when it tells 
a different story but it also can often be a cheap trick to show that how clever you are compose something and um, i waited almost two hours for this shot i wanted the butterfly to be on her head but got this instead and actually liked it better um, and then i would always focus really on showing the street how it is not putting too much of my personal personality into it but i had this documentary approach but also wanted to make it candid and try to keep that snapshot aesthetic uh, alive but also focus on on people um, i was primarily using a 28 millimeter with my gr and also my fujis and yeah i got very comfortable during this period um, taking photos uh, more close up uh, i would always look for these um, small moments um, found this very cute um, they're taking photo photos of each other and uh, it had to be candid and it had to be a moment i was always chasing these moments sometimes special extraordinary moments sometimes not so much but that is that was always um, uh, something that i uh, wanted to have in my photos this is a scene in ginza in ginza there are lots of people who dress up nicely and uh, it's a fun place in tokyo to do street photography um yeah moments like this is what i was drawn to candid moments and interactions between people uh, i'm still drawn to it but i slightly changed uh, how i take photos of these moments some more candid moments this is in osaka um, during a firework summer firework situation i also really like take taking photos of crowds um maybe because i like looking at um, photo books uh, of uh, of older generations um, that i didn't experience myself and seeing like crowds or lo lots of people in a frame it's always interesting uh, so i like to take photos of crowds because who knows how we all might change uh, this is uh, oktoberfest in munich um, this is a typical example of what i considered at that time a good street photograph it has nice composition good layers and some little moments in here um, it is not easy to capture a frame like this because the, the timing has to be right and it's totally fine i still like this uh, photograph but you will see i'm slowly trying to remove myself from these uh, structures that i gave myself these these formulas to create a successful uh, street photographs uh, another scene of from the same day um, which i also really like uh, here of course this is uh, this is a photo i also really um, like um, because um, it happened so quickly and randomly um, obviously this photograph um, benefits from the characters here that i photographed so the subject is interesting how you photograph is how you photograph it is not so important here but the subject is interesting and uh, the gestures are what i also really uh, liked here and i was in the middle of a, a video shoot a video production and i had this uh, 30 minute lunch break and i went outside to grab a sandwich or something and i had my uh, fujifilm extra 100 f uh, with the wide angle conversion lens around my neck and i didn't really i wasn't really in the mode of taking photos um, but i always have my camera with me so i was ready and then i saw this um, couple i don't know i saw the, these two and i thought oh these i have to take a photo and um, they were walking towards me i was walking towards them i had my camera here around chest height and yeah it is a hip shot but i looked at the screen and make sure the composition is almost how i want it took one photo and this was it um yeah and uh, this photo you know uh, ended up at some competitions and, and and walls and some galleries and it was a very quick snapshot um and this is i don't want to downplay myself here but 
anyone can take a photo like this. You just have to be quick and react fast. And without interesting content, right? A photograph is not interesting if there's nothing interesting in it. Because these two are very interesting to look at, it makes it easy to make an interesting photograph. Um, so for me, this is kind of a cheap shot, but it's still, for me, uh, it's still a photo I like because um, I never seen these two again in Cologne and I haven't seen anyone else taking photos of them. So maybe they changed how they look. I don't know. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, a scene in, in London um, during Halloween. Uh, I was just on the way to, to my hotel, had a suitcase and my camera in my backpack. Um, saw this moment and quickly got my camera. Um, but this shows again, I'm very much looking at the scene, candid and trying also to include the environment. Then there came a little bit of a shift. My updated street photography philosophy uh, was still 100% candid, but make it a bit more mysterious. And timeless is, is good. I was always saying that my photographs are also documenting society and the times we are living in. So I want people to see in, what, um, in which, which time I took the photo. But nowadays I, I think timeless is not that bad. I like photos that are timeless. Subjective is good. Not every moment needs to be extraordinary. And embrace quiet moments means um, I just showed you this uh, these two characters um, and that's still interesting of course I'm going to take photos of something that looks interesting but also focusing on more quieter moments and more um, how do you say introverted no in intro I'm missing that uh, verb but photos that go inside something and not just the surface uh, and photography from the gut, very important, no overthinking, which is something I think all of us, we will learn over time. But in the beginning, we take photos based on formulas and structures and themes that we learn from other photographers or other, art, other arts. And that's okay, but it's really important to get back, get back to um, photo, uh, taking photos more from from an emotional reaction from from the gut and uh, not so much not think too much about the work so here are a few photographs from the same period but that are a little bit more mysterious um, this is in Ginza there was a huge fish bowl and I thought it would look cool to see these fishes these fish flying in, in the city uh, another scene in, in uh, Ginza uh, it's one of the photos that is hanging uh, at your venue. Um, a little interesting fun fact here. Lots of people think that the camera is my camera here in the frame, but this is actually the camera of uh, Ulysses Aoki, my friend in Tokyo, uh, who was standing next to me. And this is a reflection of him and then another reflection of what's going on behind me and then what's going on in front of me. And I was standing inside... Uh, a Tesla showroom uh, which had a lot of glass uh, windows um, and I really like this photo because it's also it's 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 not a particular moment but the expressions and this is for me more realistic a more realistic depiction of Tokyo city life than showing these beautiful moments these happiness moments you know because Tokyo has this very serious and uh, exhausting uh, side as well um, a photo I took in Paris um, this is what I mean with embracing quieter moments um, I have a little series on my website I want to make more out of it but for now it's it's on my website regardless uh, where I um, Focus on, on, on scenes where people are, um, are how do you say, in their own world. They are thinking about something. They are maybe worrying about the future or taxes or whatever bills to pay. And uh, when you see these moments, I think they're relatable. We are all in our own heads. And it's very hard to find these moments. But 
I also like to focus on that. Um, this is uh, London, Hyde Park, very early in the morning, 7 a.m. Um, my friends uh, in London told me that the that in Hyde Park people would swim in winter uh, in this um, pond and and I couldn't believe it because it was winter and uh, we wanted to see it. We all went there. Then these uh, swimmers would show up and it ha happened very fast. Uh, the guy here was sliding down a slide um, and I took two photos and luckily one was this moment um, shot on the Ricoh GR, GS3. Um, and yeah, I really like this one uh, because it's a it's again, it's a happy moment, it's a candid moment, but it still has a little bit of this layer of uh, mysteriousness because it's monochrome, you have this uh, this mist. I like the, the swan in the background putting its head in the water. It's a nice little detail. Um, and you don't quite know when it was made. It could be an old photograph, could be a recent photograph. This is a, an older one, uh, 2017. I took this in Bordeaux. I was. Uh, this was actually on a honeymoon trip with my wife. Um, we we married in 2017, and we went to France for our honeymoon. And um, I wasn't really focusing on taking photos, but this um, plaza here had these um, water fountains, and it created this uh, fork situation. And then there was this mother playing with her son, like dancing and hugging him, and. Um, uh, yeah, I got this moment and uh, really like how uh, it looks based on because of this fog situation and um, yeah, a scene in uh, Tokyo, uh, 2019 um, when the Olympic Games were supposed to be held in 2020. Um, another candid moment, and you can see that all these images are monochrome because I started to focus more on taking photos in monochrome. That's something that I feel most comfortable with. And I like how monochrome makes something a little bit more open to interpretation. You don't know the color of the dress or the um, the cap of the swimmer balloon here in the background. You don't know the, these informations, but maybe they're not important. Um, so I like how black and white can reduce uh, a scene into something um, yeah, new and more mysterious. Um, let me know guys if I'm too slow or, is it, or this is too long because um, I'm almost at the end but probably 10 minutes is it okay if I continue? Samuel, it, it is okay yeah. uh, I just have to ask because as you are Japanese and German okay, yeah, uh, and we are Mexicans <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't have anything uh, else uh, important to do maybe you have a schedule, if not we are mm -hmm. being very amused. This is so insightful. So we are grateful if you can continue. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, um, my wife can wait. <laughs> this is fine. And I have, uh, I'm only waiting. Uh, we will have dinner after this, but it's totally fine. I have time. Um, okay, I'm almost, yeah, I'm Great. almost done. So, um, okay, continuing. So this is Hamburg uh, fish market. Um, yeah. What can I say? Um, if you have more questions about individual images, uh, feel free to ask later. Um, I like these kind of moments. So, um, okay, this is uh, indoors, right? This is inside um, a ballet school. Uh, my wife was, um, my wife is a pianist, um, ballet pianist, and she was playing for a workshop. And I was uh, waiting for her, and I had uh, two hours uh, to time to two hours of time to pass. And I was sitting next to her, wasn't able to do anything else. I was on my phone, and I had my GR with me, of course. And I was bored. I was taking photos of her with the piano and the reflections. And then um, this is another like I didn't think of this image to take this image, but I would just take photos and play with my camera play with the crop mode. This is the 35 millimeter crop mode. And then these kids would start jumping and without thinking too much, I was just taking photos. And then I was looking at my screen and then this popped up and I was like, wait a minute, this is kind of interesting because it looks like they're floating because they're so synchronized. 
and they're all looking out of the window or so it seems and yeah without knowing it i took a photo that i uh, really really like and lots of people seem to like and i sold some prints of that as well and it is um it's crazy how sometimes you get these images at uh, um, at places where you don't expect them to show up so um, that's why we always have to take photos wherever we are because sometimes we don't even see the potential so and if you co would consider this street photography or not i don't care it's uh, something that happens in the city for me this is uh, still part of my uh, street photography or life photography or whatever um uh, okay, some projects here that have something to do with street photography. Um, because I'm a Record GR ambassador, I also get uh, to play with some Pentax gear sometimes. Uh, sometimes I don't need to, sometimes I don't want to. In this case, uh, Pentax released a monochrome sensor camera and I was very interested in trying it out um, because I was very into monochrome at this time. Um, so, Rico, um, so Rico is Pentax. Uh, um, they asked me to uh, take a series of photos um, in urban uh, environments. They really would like to see some street photography, but because street photography is candid and um, in Germany, um, when it comes to uh, image rights or legally street photography is allowed to do as, as a practice, but publishing is a different beast. So to be safe, they asked me to not take photos of people or not make them recognizable, which was a challenge, but I was happy to be challenged and um, I had a week to take uh, photos with it. Um, I wanted to photograph my hometown, Hamburg, and um, yeah, just started looking for scenes that I can take photos of. This is a famous landmark in Hamburg, uh, the Elbe Philharmonic. Um, which you see at the harbor of Hamburg. And I was taking this ferry because I like to be on the ferry. Um, I also teach workshops in my city. And this is a place where we often go because the ferry has interesting also situations. Um, and it doesn't cost you anything. If you have a regular train ticket, you can ride these ferries. So, and then I noticed this um, this sign, which uh, just means um, it's a sign for, for the staircase. So you can go up one level of the ferry. And I saw that and I thought, this looks kind of like the Elf Philharmonic uh, building. So I waited for, for this building to show up and uh, juxtapose it to this um, sign. Uh, this is a reflection of that uh, building. You can also go up um, and uh, get a um, access, a viewpoint within this Elf Philharmonic building, which is a very modern architecture. It's very fun to take photos there but very difficult because there are so many reflective surfaces. And uh, I went there so many times, but somehow on this day I found this new uh, situation which I've never seen before. I'm very happy I found this uh, for this assignment. Um, Easter fire situation, testing the low light capabilities. Um, I was taking photos of uh, close-ups uh, or details um, this was a, a fair in Hamburg um, and here two more uh, situations. Quite happy with the right uh, photograph. That was on my last day. I thought that uh, that is it, no more photos. And then I spent half an hour here at this uh, Ferris wheel. We really, really wanted to get something that looks a little bit more complex. Um, and not just the Ferris wheel. So I saw this plant, and put it into the frame and just hoped that uh, the people would also create some interesting silhouettes. And it's a little bit chaotic, but sometimes you get these images that have a good kind of chaos. So um, then uh, I did this um, film with uh, Siegfried Hansen for Leica for the Q2 monochrome launch, which was a... Um, promotional video for the camera and we shot this entire video in, in black and white um, and uh, I was the cinematographer I did this video and I was also taking some behind the scenes photos and uh, I don't know I, I said this uh, online uh, during a live stream once I, d I know Leica doesn't like it 
but they could have sent me a Leica camera to film this video. Uh, I shot this uh, with a Fujifilm camera using the Acros film simulation. So I didn't even shoot color, I just shot it in black and white with the Fujifilm simulation, which I think is totally enough uh, if you want to take monochrome photos. Um, some BT, um, behind the scenes photos that I also took, these were later used um, to uh, for a landing page for this campaign. Then uh, very recently, um, which is an interesting showcase of how you can use street photography in a commercial uh, way. Um, so um, because I was uh, working with Siegfried Hansen uh, already, um, he got asked uh, from Xiaomi to do this um, masterclass, online masterclass about street photography. Um, and he was uh, he had to use a smartphone for that, a new smartphone from Xiaomi, which was co-engineered with Leica. And then uh, he asked me to uh, produce these, this masterclass series. And I thought that I would just be the producer the filmmaker um, but Xiaomi wanted me to also be in the video and take photos with him like we we are like these two photography friends who take photos on the street um, which was fine with me but a little stressful because I also had to deliver some photos with the phone and I'm not used to taking photos with the phone and again I had to um, also make sure that I don't take photos of people, uh, of faces, which also make, made it very challenging. Uh, a little BTS shot of us pretending uh, to have fun. No, we had a lot of fun. It was actually a, a fun experience, challenging uh, ourselves to use a phone. Um, here are some photos that I was able to take uh, with that phone. Um, of course, I, w I got inspired by Siegfried to focus on uh, graphical shapes. Um, quite happy with these casually taking photos uh, while we were filming. Um, and uh, Xiaomi used these uh, photos um, on their social media channels. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, one last uh, project or a little bit of a personal development I'm currently doing. So, um, Right up to 2020, um, I was so much into street photography, doing lots of projects with Rico. 2020 was actually supposed to be uh, my best year when it comes to street photography and filmmaking because uh, Rico and I, we just had agreed on um, making, uh, continuing a, a video series we did on my channel called uh, The GR Project, uh, where I uh, visited other GR photographers and spent a few days with them in their city. Uh, really fun project, really loved working on that. And then in 2020, I was supposed to, um, actually I was supposed to make uh, one video every month, so, so 12 videos in a year. Uh, I had to actually say, you know, I can't, I have to, uh, I have a private life, so I told them let's make it every two months, so six videos which is still a lot, but that would have meant that uh, the whole 2020 I would have um, I would have traveled and uh, took lots of photos on my GR, which unfortunately didn't happen, as you all know. So, and then at the same time, um, you know, COVID was happening and um, because uh, within me is still also a photojournalist who wants to uh, document um, what's happening. Um, and uh, so I focused on uh, documenting um, my environment and, and my city and uh, during lockdown for example we were allowed to be in the city take walks, uh, go to um, a market um, but we were not allowed to gather in groups and uh, I was just curious what's going on taking photos of um, everything I, I can see and it was also a time with a lot of um, uncertainty. We didn't know how long is this going to continue. People lost their jobs. Uh, I lost my job opportunities for the year. Um, it was a dark time. And for, to me personally, I, I think a lot of us also got a little depressed because if you can't do what you like to do, then you get a little depressed, right? And um, so that was something I had to deal with. And my way of dealing with that is taking photos. Um, it's a little lockdown situation here. 
So, and then of course there was uh, also a lot of, um, uh, how do you say, conflict between uh, citizens and the government. And uh, I was very interested in seeing this uh, change in society also. The one side was saying, stay at home and oblige. And uh, the other one is um, obey, I mean. And the other part is saying, no, we want our freedom back. And um, this whole conflict was uh, super interesting to me, just what, how society changed. And um, uh, I also had to go to London for a RICO uh, job in September, which was not during lockdown, but uh, during the pandemic. And uh, I saw this and I was like, oh, this is so dystopian. I have to take a photo of this. Um, because now this looks like out of a movie or something. This is uh, like 28 days later, or, you know, some horror dystopian movie, but it was actually reality. And um, so, yeah. So during, so I hope this is not too graphic uh, for some of you, but while this was happening, um, my private life was going through a lot of changes. Uh, my wife became pregnant and um, I became a father in 2021. So, and we were kicked out of our apartment uh, in 2020 because our um, the owner, owner, uh, owner of our apartment wanted to, uh, wanted to use her apartment. So we had to move out. At the same time, we were in the process of buying uh, uh, our own house, or we wanted to buy our own house. Um, luckily, we found a place, but we had this transition period, five months. We had to um, be somewhere with our stuff. And uh, on the left, you see my wife here. Um, we uh, spent five months uh, some at someone's uh, rooftop apartment um, with lots of card box, uh, moving boxes, and, you know, because she just had to relax and be at home, um, there wasn't much for her to do. I was uh, having all these adventures, uh, taking photos uh, outside and uh, coming back with all these uh, stories and being worried about the future. But at the same time, there was something going on in my private life. Um, and then, yeah, my son was born in 2021 and we moved out into the countryside. He was actually, he actually came one year after we moved into our house. So a lot of things happened. Uh, this is my grandfather again. Um, he passed away in 2021. So it was the same year my son was born. Um, I lost my grand grandfather. Um, the next year I went back to Japan with my family and I visited his uh, atelier, so where he worked. And uh, he was always wearing this fisherman hat. It was kind of his... Uh, some symbol for him and I saw this here hanging there and um, took a photo because it felt kind of like he's still in his uh, atelier. So I'm showing you this because I wasn't quite sure what I'm doing. Uh, I wanted to do a project about the pandemic. That was my initial idea because, has, because I had all these images. Um, but I also took all these personal uh, images. Um, for example, of course, after my son was born, uh, I focused uh, entirely on being there for my family and being there for my son, experiencing it, becoming a father and being in a new environment as well. So I started to take uh, a lot of photos, uh, lots of photos of my son. Um, eventually, I um, wanted to make a book out of my pandemic uh, photos and I uh, met up here with a friend and to discuss uh, ideas and look at my work. And I told him all these stories about how my grandfather passed away, my son was born and moving out of the city. And then uh, he told me that, um, you know, a project about the pandemic, uh, yeah, it might be interesting in the future to look back at this work, but why does it need to be you? Or, you know, how attached are you on to this project? And um, he said, it's much more interesting if you include these personal images and make it about how you felt during this time and what you experienced. And first I thought, no, I don't want to make it about me. I want to make it about what I saw. But he opened my eyes to um, the idea of including work that um, might look too personal to share, um, but makes 
the other image is maybe more interesting because it creates a, a context of what the photographer experienced and what the situation was like because i'm sure if i ask anyone here of you um what you did in 2020 you probably have your own stories to tell and everyone has experienced um, something and it was a unique time for all of us so instead of making these books about the pandemic and see see what kind of what an amazing photographer i am i captured these people in masks well rather than doing that i think it's more interesting to see a uh, work of photographers who captured this this face not only what they saw but also what they went through and um, because it was such a intense and personal uh, intense um, time of my life i wanted to um, capture it and uh, remember it and look back and have something um, to show to my to my son or my grandkids eventually um, so i wanted to make a book about for myself anyways but then he my friend suggested to put that all in a book and just make the project about uh, this period in my life and the the the, the, the pandemic is just a background a stage for this personal story um, so I, I ended up liking the idea and now i'm in this um, weird situation where i don't know how to tell this story in a book form but my goal is to eventually uh, create a book and um, uh, i also never published anything yet so i consider myself to be totally in the beginning of whatever this career is going to be um, of course i i have done a lot so far in the past but um, myself as a photographer my goal is to have my work published in a book something i can leave behind something curated right i think especially as street photographers we want to uh, eventually have our work condensed and and maybe have a little message behind it um, which is always a challenge because uh, it's always exciting to be out on the street taking photos of everything but um, we also learn a lot about our work looking back and um, these two or three years during the pandemic also gave me the opportunity to look back and discover this um, new aspect that i haven't um, that i have neglected before so uh, i want to i think this is the last one i want to end this uh, with giving you a little bit of an idea how i'm looking at my work right now so this is a little bit of a snapshot of everything i'm my work is right now <laughs> so you have a little bit of street photography and i have a little bit of photojournalism and then you have a little bit of um, personal uh, work as well and i think it does mix kind of well um, so I'm going to read this for, for you. So everything I create is my uh, work, meaning that um, everything I consider now part of my portfolio. Even if I do a YouTube video or do a little blog post or whatever, it's all part of a big um, portfolio. Uh, my personality and my private life is connected to the work I do. If I don't feel something, I don't create it. Uh, street photography is only one branch of the tree that is my artistic vision. I know it sounds a little bit pretentious, um, but that's how I see it. Street photography is something I, it's very important to me. I will always do it. As I say here, it's a lifestyle, an endless pursuit, um, an extension of uh, the joy that is photography for me. And I always have a camera with me. I always document. This is just, I can't not do it. It's uh, I, I lo love it so much and I will never stop doing that. But I realized that all this photography in the end is um, is is connected so i have to some way also accept that and if i want to grow as an artist i think i should look at all i do and not only say here's my street photography work here's this work here's that um, and i like the idea of making it more personal um, yeah the human experience is art in itself uh, our experiences uh, are individual, unrepeatable, unique. Um, and I believe that art without human presence is not really art. Um, that's why I'm also, <laughs> I'm not a hater and not against AI, but I don't consider AI art as art because uh, it's based on on real art from, from humans. 
but it's generated. So there's no personal backstory. There's no suffering involved. There's no desire, human desire involved. Um, I think we definitely need to have our personality and our work. Um, this is also, uh, I'm, I'm ending this, but one last story. Uh, I, I met uh, Tatsuo again um, last year in, Lu in Luxembourg. He was there for a festival. And after five years, we met again, so long time. And we talked about this um, this time, this period, um, the pandemic. Um, uh, he also made uh, went through some changes. And, and I told him how I uh, ended up now um, thinking about my work as, um, as a whole. And he said, this is actually exactly what, so in his words, this is exactly what I'm also doing. He said, he says that his work, um, everything he does, um, adds, uh, creates a document. Um, I think in Japan there's this word for whatever you leave behind is your document. Uh, it's hard to translate it. So he takes photos of his dog, of his neighborhood. He takes uh, portraits. He takes street photography. Uh, but he mixes it together in his zines. And he says um, he's over this street photography close up and getting some tension out of people he's now more interested in discovering um, himself again through these other um, things he's doing so yeah that really encouraged me as well hearing that and hearing that uh, he went through a different a similar phase um, so what can i say i can only encourage you to uh put back a little bit of personality uh, in your in your work and um, maybe look at uh, everything you do as uh, something that adds to you as as an artist or photographer and um, I don't know that's it <laughs> if you have any questions then uh, let's uh, get to it sorry that was very long one and a half hours almost I haven't pr I haven't practiced this <laughs> And I don't, I don't hear you. Um, your mic is off, I think. Yeah, yeah. I have to thank you for going the extra time with us. Uh, as as I told you a minute, few minutes ago, it has been very insightful for me. Uh, there is a big lesson in your presentation, which is do work close to your heart, and things will come uh, together by themselves. I, I can I can see this from your life uh, travel in this presentation and and this lesson comes very close to me. So thank you. Uh, so Samuel, uh, if you have still a few minutes spare, we can of course, of course. answer some questions from our audience or from people online. I know David wants to leave, but it's fine. The rest can stay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Alguien de la audiencia tiene pregunta aquí? If you want, of course. Okay, I think they are they are overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have an, a question in, on the screen. Oh yeah. I will close my presentation. Yeah. Can you read it? Can you see? Um, it? Oh yeah. Um, it's from uh, from Louis himself. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going so, to read it. Okay. Okay. So how has your photography been influenced by having the possibility of meeting so many great photographers through your, for, through your projects? Um, yes. Um, well, uh, of course, I learned a lot by I, I'm learning. I learned so much from other photographers. Um, this is uh, one of the main reasons why I still do my YouTube channel because I get I get so much I gain so much from it. Uh, I share a lot about my my own work and myself, but um, meeting other photographers is always um, very insightful and uh, making these connections um, is very valuable. And um, uh, how they influenced me? Um, well, let me see how. Uh, you're asking if my photography influenced the possibility of meeting other photographers. Um, maybe not so much. I think my YouTube channel gave me some opportunities, but I don't think my work has uh, enabled me to meet other people. Um, people seem to connect through my work as well, but 
um, mostly I think people connect through me as a person who is uh, sharing um, also the, the process behind it. So, um, yeah, what else can I say? This, uh, I hope I, I don't know if I understood the question. Was that? I, I believe so. <laughs> I, I believe you, you did. Okay. Uh, What's up, Dan? One of my YouTube members is watching. Just have to say hi. <laughs> yeah. So um, let me see if there are more online questions. I have one of my own. But I'm going to leave yeah, it. I don't see all of them. I only see the okay. ones here on the screen. You know, uh, every nationality has a, a medium character, no? Mm -hmm. So you are German, you are Japanese, and you have shot in other countries. Do you find that the, these uh, characters of cultures uh, make street photography different on each place, especially in Germany or Japan? What's your experience? Yes, um, it's uh, depending on the place, it can be very, uh, the experience can be very different uh, from each other. Um, so, unfortunately, I've never been to, to Mexico. I don't know how it is to take photos where you live, but uh, uh, I can only speak for Europe, Japan, and uh, I've been to uh, New York once, um, only once. Um, so, Europe is definitely, um, how do you say, first of all, it is a little bit harder here to take candid photos because the privacy laws are a little bit more strict than uh, compared to America or Japan. Um, so that makes it harder, but also the mentality between people in different countries differ also so much. Germans are very scared and um, suspicious of people taking photos, especially if you don't ask. So. I, I really challenge uh, everyone to come to Germany and try street photography. Here. It's it's really not that easy. Um, you can. It depends also on your body language. Um, I never had any problems. Um, um, no one was really angry at me. Um, but I definitely feel more relaxed in other countries. In Japan, for example, it's no issue. You can take photos. No one cares. Um, because pe Japanese people might not like you to take photos of them, but they will never challenge you or confront you. So if you want to be an asshole, you can just take photos without any care in the world in Japan. Of course, you should not do that. You should still be a decent human being and respect um, people as much as you can. Um, so and then uh, cultural differences, obviously, in, uh, in Asia, um, in Japan, people respect um, if, uh, how do you say, they, they, they want to keep the harmony in the, in the society. Um, and if you disrupt it, then uh, you're seen as a threat. And uh, so you don't want to do things that are totally fine in Europe. For example, people in the public, they don't, uh, like couples, they don't really hug and show affection, or don't, don't kiss in public. It's it's seen as a little bit, uh, it's something you do in private. But in Europe and in Germany, it's normal. You see that in the, on the street. So as a street photographer, you might miss human in connection and emotions in Japan. Um, but you get, you have more freedom of um, of uh, the act of street photography. It's, more, it's easier in Japan. But in Europe, you will find uh, more genuine reactions and emotions, uh, interactions within people, uh, with other people. So I prefer taking photos in Europe because I'm focusing on uh, people and I want to see people being themselves. And in Japan, you don't always see them people being themselves. Yeah. And then in New York, um, I mean, New York is New York. Uh, I had a very good time and uh, I would like to come back and during summer. Um, but I'm more interested in being in Europe because it's uh, New York is well documented and uh, Europe. Um, this is something I also always tell people is if you live in a small town or a city that no one really knows or, or not many people know, then that's actually a benefit 
this is an advantage because there might not be a lot of photographers who document the city so you can take that uh, for your advantage and, and show your place and someone in japan will see that and be will be totally fascinated by it so yeah yeah that's that's a great insight we we have a question by dan lebron uh, yep. about your your street photography celebrity wish list uh oh uh, yeah of course um so when i started my channel i made a list of people i want to work with and there are still a lot of people that i haven't met yet um wish list um i would like to do something with eric kim just for fun um i try to reach out to him i know he knows i exist um but it just does isn't happening and he i don't know what he's doing now um I mean, I know what he's doing now. You can all look it up. <laughs> but he's an interesting character. I want to know more about him, you know, why he disappeared and talk a little bit about social media and that kind of stuff. Uh, then, yeah, then of course, um, wow, I don't know. There's so many photographers I would like to meet. Um, still want to meet Matt Stewart someday. I've never met him. Uh, I would like to meet, uh, do something with Trent Park. He's a huge... Uh, hero of mine I, I love what he's doing um also his wife uh, of course uh i don't know i just see what kind of opportunity i can get um i don't chase people because i know everyone is busy and every encounter i have always happens because it's the right time there's, there's the encounter with tattoo was just it, it was meant to be it just happened and if it's not meant to be then it's okay i will find someone else Okay, well, yeah. he, I hope uh, they see this video and schedule a time with you, every one of them. <laughs> yeah. So, Samuel, uh, it seems it's time to end this uh, so interesting, so amusing chat. Um, we are so thankful for your time, uh, for the effort you put in, in this presentation. Uh, My pleasure. Uh, well, we are all grateful and if you have anything else to to say to finish this transmission <laughs> thanks guys thanks for sticking to the end <laughs> hey david what's it up <laughs> yeah um i don't know what else to say other than thank you for for doing this um it has been uh, fun being part of this um yeah i also uh, came into contact with some of the, the the guests you had like betty go for example i never had contact with her but i knew her now we are chatting on instagram we will meet in december in hamburg it's going to be cool um it's very cool yeah and interesting guests you also invited um good selection and uh congratulations for this first uh festival and hopefully we can continue doing this in the future we hope we can fly you in sometime in the next edition that would be amazing uh, yeah i would really love to be in mexico someday Okay, yeah. Samuel. So enjoy enjoy time with you with your wife. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. bye, guys. Enjoy. Bye, bye. Thank you. <laughs> Mexico. <laughs> Mexico. <laughs> México Street Photo Fest Síguenos en nuestras redes sociales